There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Biniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with another In Other Words, which is an occasional series where I talk about vocabulary, idioms, grammatical expressions that I encounter in my reading. I am no expert in these matters, but I do love doing deep dives in etymological and such like dictionaries online. So let's get started. Six pieces of vocabulary. The first couple, I forget how many, the first three maybe, are from Thomas Hardy's Far From the Madding Crowd, which I am almost halfway through. I've been reading it at a snail's pace and deeply, deeply enjoying it. And I've got a few from that tonight. The first one is portcullis. And I don't know if I had ever seen this word. I certainly didn't know what it meant. It is a strong, heavy grating that can be lowered down grooves on each side of a gateway to block it. So once I looked at a picture of a portcullis, I knew exactly what it was. So here's a few pictures of, uh, I don't know what the plural of portcullis is, portcullises, portculi, I don't know, but here's a few pictures. This goes back to medieval castles as a way of securing the castle during times of attack or siege. And it goes back to an old French word, port police, which I don't know how to pronounce, meaning sliding gate, but first appeared in English around the year 1300. Port, meaning gate, going back to the Latin porta, which goes back to the Proto-Indo-European root per. Stay tuned for more on that. And colis, meaning sliding or flowing, which went back to the Latin collatus, which was a form of the verb colare, meaning to filter or strain, which is where we get the word colander from. So portcullis and colander have the same linguistic ancestor. Why, though? Think about it. What's the connection between a colander? If you now know, if you didn't already know, what a portcullis is, and everybody knows what a colander is, but when you think of them, what is the connection? Colander is some kind of a pot or container, vessel, perforated with little holes to allow the liquid to run off. Uh, the medieval Latin collatorium, meaning strainer, and like we said, colari, meaning to strain, column, meaning sieve, strainer, wicker fishing net and there are cognates in french spanish and italian nobody knows exactly the history of this word in english other than what i've just said apparently and because of that lack of the uh, various gradations of this word in english maybe the connections between colander and portcullis portcullis are lost to us but i can think of sliding and running off through the holes, there's something maybe there. But I don't know. Any ideas? Let's go back to the Proto-Indo-European root, per, because it means forward and by extension, in front of, before, first, chief, toward, near, against. So there is a mitload of words that we get from that Proto-Indo-European root, per. I will give you a, a rundown of the ones that are of interest to me. Approach, appropriate, approve, approximate, foremost, forefather, former, fourth, impervious, impromptu, improve, paradise, pardon, permanent, permeate, priest, pride, primitive, principle, Probably pro, profound, profuse, provide, provoke, reprove, veneer. Oh my god. Now some of those I can hear that uh, prepositional force, meaning forward, in front of, before, near. Others I can't. Hey guys, this is Editing Sean. I decided to delete the next word, which was the curious word froward, F-R-O-W-A-R-D, from this video, because I kept getting so mixed up about which direction, towards and away from, in my explication, that you would have been completely confused because I was confused. It's a fascinating word, and it goes back to the same root as the last word, per, but I botched it, so I will redo that in the next video. And this video will have one less 
vocabulary item in it. Uh, I am reading a history of India. What the heck is it called? It is called India, a history by John Key. And I'm really enjoying it, but it's going to take me about two years to read it because I'm not devoting a lot of time to it, but certainly enjoying what I'm reading. And there's a few little things of etymological interest. And the one today is mainstay. I vaguely knew the meaning of mainstay, but I didn't know why mainstay means what it means. So the figurative meaning that most of us know is a person or thing on which something else is based or depends. Farming is the mainstay of the rural economy. Vertibola is the mainstay of Booktube, for example. But that comes from the literal meaning, which I didn't know, and it's to do with sailing ships. I'm not at all qualified to explain that sailing meaning other than to put up a bunch of diagrams and illustrations on the screen and hope that you can figure it out. But a mainstay is a stay that extends from the main top to the foot of the foremast of a sailing ship. What is a stay? A stay is a rope, wire, or rod on sailing vessels that runs fore and aft. I think I've got those directions. Fore meaning forward, aft. Along the center line from the masts to the hull deck, bowsprit, or to other masts. And the purpose of a stay is to stabilize the masts. So the main stay is the one that goes from the main top to the foot of the foremast. So the word stay, meaning support, prop, or brace, it came into English in the early 16th century from the Middle French. But the meaning that meant the strong rope, which supports a ship's mast, comes from Old English steg, and the Proto-Germanic stagaz, going through to Dutch, Low German, German, Old Norse. It goes back to a Proto-Indo-European root, sta. Sta means to stand, set down, make, or be firm. So you can see the connections between that and to support something. And the derivative meaning being a place or thing that is standing. So we've got a whole swack of words here. Contrast, constitute, constant, distant, prostate, prostitute, resist, stature, statue, store, stem, superstition, system that derive from that same Proto-Indo-European root. So mainstay is etymologically related to a prostitute. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. I started reading but soon abandoned this German novel from the late 19th century, Effie Briest by Theodor Fontana. I don't know the pronunciation and I don't care because it was such a boring book. I bailed uh, quite early, but there was one expression and it's just a word that I thought, oh, this is a chance to delve into the meaning of this word, and that is a character tucked into the gooseberries, which meant, in British English, that he or she started eating them quite enthusiastically. To tuck into something means to eat something heartily. British English. I think I've never heard it in Canada, and don't think it's ever been on Friends or Dynasty. I think it's a British term. So why does that phrasal verb tuck into a phrasal verb is a two-word verb consisting of the main verb tuck and the particle in or into the verb tuck meaning to pull or gather up or to pluck or to stretch entered english in the late 14th century and that's enough about the origin because it doesn't really help us with this much more modern meaning in british english of tucking into some food in North America, we're used to using tuck to tuck in your shirt into your pants or parents tucking their small children into bed. So fitting the sheets or the shirt tightly around the body or around the child in bed. So what's the connection? Nobody knows for sure, but the best that etymologists have been able to come up with is that you're tucking in your shirt or you're tucking in your child, you're, you're tucking the food into your mouth tightly because it's so delicious. You're, you're cramming it in. But there also is a connection, going back to Australian English more than British English, which is tucker, which was another word for food as early as 1833 in Australian English. And across the English-speaking world, 
tuck, meaning some kind of a food shop, like with the military. There was a tuck shop at my Bible camp where I went and was unsuccessfully evangelized as a kid that also had a connection to food. But nobody knows exactly for sure. So if you have any theories or scholarship or ideas, please give me a comment. I am reading a fantastic collection of short stories by the African-American writer Edward P. Jones called Lost in the City. And the last two today, very quickly, are from that fabulous collection. A fence. In one of the early stories set in fairly modern times, one of the secondary characters was described as being a fence. And I go, huh? Well, it's not African-American English, but a fence, informally, slang, is a person who deals in stolen goods. So if we look at the meaning of the noun fence that, you know, is the the thing that separates one property from another or keeps the sheep in some kind of a barrier, that word as a noun entered English in the early 14th century. And it's connected to the idea of defense, fence and defense, very closely related. We also get fender and the verb fend to fend off criticism from that same word family. And the sense of a dealer in stolen goods, that is thieves slang or criminal slang, and that meaning, that slang meaning uh, that was used by thieves, first showed up in English in around the year 1700. And the idea was that those transactions, the buying and selling of stolen goods, took place under the defense of secrecy. So they were defended from capture, from arrest by the secret setting and context of the transaction. So a fence was somebody who sold stolen goods secretly, defending against capture or arrest. The last one is one of my favorite words. It's a word that I use a lot because there's so many of them in the world, and that is doofus. (laughs) Doofus, it's North American slang for a stupid person. And it showed up in an Edward B. Jones story, one I just read today, as a matter of fact. Nobody knows for sure, but the most convincing explanation I found was that it could be an alteration of goofus, which we don't use anymore, but from which we get the word goof, and we certainly use goof, goofy, and goof, I goofed, I made a mistake, he's a goof, don't be goofy, but there is a word in German, doof, meaning stupid, also there is or was a word in French, Goff, meaning awkward or stupid. Italian goffo. Uh, Even in Scots, there was a word doof. It's a word that's been around. It's been floating around in uh, European languages for quite some time, but we haven't been able to trace it back because we are all a bunch of doofuses. That's what I got for now. Thanks for watching. (laughs) 